Um, so as uh, Claudia mentioned, um, my name is Anand Pervez Bhatt, and I am the gender justice researcher at Oxfam GB. Um, and over the next 20 minutes or so, I would like to um, basically set the stage for presentations to follow and start off by giving a brief overview of the social norms theory that's been guiding much of our work, um, what we mean by social norms in the economy and our rationale for focusing on them in the PLG today, the practitioner learning group as well as the session here today, and why we should care about them in the context of market systems development programming and women's economic empowerment um, work. Um, as well, I would like to share some of the promising diagnostic approaches and effective strategies to addressing social norms in the economy at scale that we found both within the practitioner learning group as well as beyond through this um, literature review that I've been doing. So what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of social norms? When we posed this question in the practitioner learning group, some of the following terms came up. Shared expectations, sayings, ways of thinking and behaving with certain identities, informal rules, socialization of rules, and indeed, there are different ways of understanding and defining social norms reflected in the different approaches of academic disciplines which have contributed to the study of social norms and how it influences behavior. So economics, social psychology, gender theory, philosophy um, have all, can all help shed light on what social norms are and how they, how they influence behavior and uphold some of the gender inequalities that we're trying to address. Social norms theorists, um, Calvini and Bikiri have, and others, have um, built on these contributions and made an important distinction between <coughs> beliefs about doing what others do, which they call descriptive norms, um, and beliefs about doing what others think one should do, or what they call injunctive norms. Where all of these and other approaches converge is around six key elements. The first, that a social norm is a shared expectation or informal rule constructed by shared beliefs about what others do, um, or descriptive norms, others call them empirical expectations, and doing what others think one should do. Um, an example of um, a social norm seen to commonly underpin um, child, early, and forced marriage is a sort of shared belief that girls should be docile, should be shy, should be submissive, should marry early in order to preserve the honor of their families. Um, social norms exist within a reference group um, or the relevant others that we care about. And this reference group is comprised of those whose opinions matter the most to one's choices. So in our example of early marriage, this could be our neighbors, it could be the wider community, it could be influential religious leaders, Social norms are kept in place by social sanctions, which can be both positive in the form of approval or popularity, a sense of belonging, a sense of shared identity, or they can be negative when one fails to comply with a social norm, um, so gossiping or in extreme cases, violence. Most also agree that social norms are distinct from behaviors themselves, and they are distinct from moral norms, which are motivated by by our conscience, or what we believe to be right or wrong, as well as our personal attitudes um, and preferences themselves. So this is an important distinction because um, we've seen that people can often comply with social norms even when they contradict their own personal beliefs um, or attitudes. So in our early marriage example, parents may actually believe that their, their daughter deserves um, the right to complete her education, but may still marry her off early anyway because of social expectations to do so. Social norms do not exist in isolation. They are embedded in a thick web of beliefs, of cultural and religious values, other more systemic factors. And most importantly, social norms are not static and do change. Um, and this is important to emphasize because what we are in the business of is recognizing harmful social norms um, and seeking to change them or seeking to create them. This can happen when reference groups change or um, when gender roles become redefined for, for a variety of different reasons. Um, so why should we be concerned with social norms in the economy specifically? Why are we focusing on it in the practitioner learning group? So um, what we've realized or found is that while a lot of attention has been paid to the role of social norms 
in influencing or driving harmful practices related to um, gender-based violence, of female genital mutilation and cutting, um, child early and forced marriage, um, and a, an increasing effort has been made to systematically incorporate social norms interventions in ending violence against women and girls programs, um, design and implementation. A lot less attention has been paid to social norms and how they influence economic behavior in market systems development and women's economic empowerment programs. And this is why we felt the need to bring together practitioners uh, who are working in this area um, to basically share some common learnings, best practices, and uh, identify solutions collectively. Um, so how do we define social norms in the economy? We define them as being about gender norms, um, or social norms related to gender inequality that influence gendered roles in the economy. Um, so these could be the same norms that fuel violence against women, for instance. Um, so an example is sun bias, or the shared belief that boys are worth investing in more than girls. Um, as well, we define them as being about economic norms, or social norms related to the economy, or the shared beliefs around which economic activities um, have value in the economy and the society more generally. And these may or may not actually be linked to the cost of production or the benefits to consumer. Um, beliefs around what is considered work versus leisure, what is considered skilled versus unskilled. Um, and um, in certain dimensions of economic decision making, we find that social norms can actually be more powerful than monetized incentives, deterrence, or costs. So why should we care? Because social norms in the economy contribute to gendered um, occupational segregation, um, according those jobs done typically by men with a higher social value than those done by women. They also contribute to maintaining the gender pay gap and trapping women in low levels of seniority. Um, as well, they skew prices of products and services considered female versus male. And what this means um, in aggregate or collectively is that they shape and distort markets, economic policy and economic decision making by influencing cost-benefit analysis and investment decisions. So as an example, norms that typically um, privilege market, um, formal market labor over, say, unpaid care labor can lead to financial policies excluding household water systems um, and privileging um, large-scale irrigation projects, leading to you know, there being less investments in women's unpaid and care work. Um, lowering their productivity and, and um, reducing or acting as a barrier to their, their empowerment. Um, another example is norms that associate certain sectors or positions or levels of seniority with gender roles. Um, and what that means is that the formal labor market may not be realizing its full productivity potential because um, it's, it's, you know, continuing to perpetuate this trend in which women are overrepresented in certain sectors which are undervalued, um, less paid, um, less productive, which may not actually be best suited to their own skills and capabilities. Um, so the, the market itself may be underperforming as a result. So how do we diagnose social norms? What are some of the key considerations, challenges, and promising approaches we found? So once we've identified the behavior we are seeking to change, we need to identify which social norms, if any, um, co are contributing to sustaining that particular behavior. And as I've already shared, a social norm has to do with shared beliefs in a reference group, maintained by approval and disapproval. And if we want um, the diagnostic research to also inform our strategies and approaches, um, then we also want to know why social norms are in place and what the drivers of change could be or should be that we could, we could possibly focus on or leverage. Um, and so we need to investigate all of these key elements while diagnosing social norms. So some of the key questions um, uh, that can guide the diagnostic research could include, and I won't read them all, but um, do most people engage in a particular behavior? And is it socially motivated? Because not all, um, not all behaviors are driven by social norms. Um, how common is the behavior of interest? And what are others' expectations 
for the individual to comply. So this is getting at the distinction between descriptive and um, injunctive norms. Um, what have been the positive or negative consequences, if any, of departing from the behavior? This gives us a, an idea of social sanctions. Um, what are the shared beliefs or sayings that underpin these expectations? So here we've, we've begun to identify social norms. Um, and on understanding the drivers of change, what influences social norms? How have social norms changed over time? And what, is, what have been the drivers of change? What research methods um, have been used or can be used? So existing survey data can be used as a starting point to get information on individual attitudes and behavior. Um, so demographic health survey, world value survey, um, there are a number of different sources that can be used um, which have both data on prevalence as well as attitudes. Um, and this can help us inform a hypothesis about social norms. But people's beliefs about others are difficult to gauge through secondary data alone. And this is why different quantitative and qualitative research methods have been applied by social norms researchers mm -hmm. while doing primary research to uncover some of these elements that are difficult to, to get at with secondary data. In particular, qualitative methods have proven quite useful in discovering particular nuances in specific contexts in which social norms operate and identifying drivers of change. As well, mixed methods, so combining quantitative household surveys with qualitative research methods, can be a good way of getting the sense of the strength of the correlation between the social norms and the behaviors themselves. Social norms researchers, however, have identified a few key challenges with traditional approaches to diagnosing social norms. Firstly, that they, when they aren't um, designed with an adequate theory of social norms in mind, they tend to confuse personal beliefs, social norms, and behaviors. They can also um, not um, result in a lot of reliable information if they do not seek to address what we call the social desirability bias, or the tendency of um, respondents to respond in a way that they think is acceptable. So me saying basically what you want to hear. Um, they can also confuse respondents when asking questions um, directly to them about them. So what do you think they think you should do? So that can be a kind of confusing way of, of putting forward a question. The complexity of the process of changing social norms can be difficult to capture through surveys alone, which don't allow for respondents' critical reflection. And then extractive rather than action-orientated research methods, which don't actually use um, the diagnostic process as an opportunity to get respondents to critically reflect um, on their own personal beliefs and attitudes, can be a missed opportunity for starting a change process. So some of the promising approaches that I'd like to share from you from um, within the practitioner learning group as well as um, social norms research more broadly um, is, is firstly the use of vignettes. Now these are um, hypothetical scenarios or short stories um, in which there is an imaginary character who is also very relatable um, and questions that follow pertain to that, that imaginary character. So what would he or she do in this situation? If they didn't behave in this way, what would the consequences be? Um, as well, questions about how a typical person in the community behaves can be a good way of overcoming the social desirability bias and providing a kind of safe and impersonal avenue to explore respondents' personal beliefs and attitudes. Um, also, asking general questions around what makes a good woman versus a good man and how they feel about the sayings to tease out differences between social norms and personal beliefs and attitudes um, can be quite useful. And then another challenge that um, researchers have found is that the tools, the diagnostic tools themselves and methods can be unnecessarily complex and time consuming. Um, and what they found is that a more quick and effective way of getting at the social norm is focusing on measuring the anticipated sanctions for non-compliance. So what would happen if um, a person did not comply to a particular norm? What would be the reaction from the community or their reference group? 
And then using the diagnostic process itself as an opportunity to get respondents to reflect critically on their perceptions um, or beliefs. And Imogen um, and Pushpita will be, will be talking about that a little bit more in, and how it's informed our own approach to diagnosing social norms in Oxfam. So I'd like to take um, the next few minutes to just share some of the strategies or approaches that we found to be um, most useful for addressing um, social norms in the economy at scale. Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> so firstly, working with couples. So Promundo, CARE, and Oxfam's programmatic evaluations and qualitative feedback have found that um, adopting a gender-synchronized approach, which involves um, working with couples as opposed to men or women alone, is a, a key driver um, for sustainable change. And this involves creating sort of spaces for dialogue and communication between partners to jointly identify um, and challenge the social norms, not only within the wider community, but also within their, within their relationships. Um, secondly, um, across the board, we find that adopting an integrated system-wide approach, which involves working with multiple actors um, at different levels of the ecosystem, um, is very, very critical, especially when we talk about achieving scale. And CARE will be um, hopefully talking about that a little bit more. Um, and their approach really exemplifies this. And they work at multiple levels. So they start off with their own staff and um, do a bit of critical self-reflection <coughs> and get to understand how social norms are affecting their own lives. And then working with individuals and households and market actors and um, influential leaders. So working, having a more holistic approach um, to, to shifting social norms. Thirdly, anal analyzing risks and building allies from the initiation of the program. So identifying who the key opinion makers are um, and working very closely with them. And this is particularly critical um, when we want to ensure the legitimacy of new information that challenges um, the existing or prevailing norms. Also, effectively using creative channels of communication. Um, Oxfam's Empower Youth for Work program and My Rights, My Voice program has found that particularly with younger cohorts, um, using radios, community theater, and videos um, as mediums for reinforcing messages that not only challenge um, descriptive norms, so behavior that is considered to be typical but may not be typical, so actually men do do some care work. And here are some examples. Um, but where it is typical, also challenging um, injunctive norms. So this is not okay, this should not be the case, even if it is. Um, and then secondly, identifying what the positive norms, cultural values, or potential opportunities are. So how can we use sort of values which are close to the hearts of particular communities? So they could be values around family, respect, fairness, integrity, to inform our own um, messaging and communication. And lastly, for, um, for influencing policymakers and achieving scale at that level, um, what Oxfam's Women's Economic Empowerment uh, and Care Program, um, through its research and advocacy, has found is the importance of understanding what the existing narratives are. Um, what the priorities and the agendas of policymakers are, and identifying within those key entry points for engaging in a conversation. So for instance, with certain um, economic policymakers and international financial institutions, the increasing focus on women's labor force participation and um, the SMART economics parameter, as they call it, um, was identified as a key entry point, just an entry point, we know that uh, women's economic empowerment is not equal to labor force participation, but using it as an entry point to engage in a, in a conversation about issues that we deeply care about is very important. Um, and then also we've heard a lot over the past few days about the importance of data and evidence. And we also find that with, um, particularly with government officials and economic policy makers, being able to show through evidence, even at a local level, um, the link between changes in social norms and achieving economic outcomes is very, very critical. And then being propositional. So, um, you know, what are offering 
sort of a few key clear solutions as opposed to a whole laundry list. Um, government officials often asked, often said that you know you made a really clear problem statement, but what is the one thing I or we can do um, to start this change process? Um, and that's it. I think I've spoken enough. Thank you. Thank you.